All right, this video is the second part of module 31 on cognition. Um, so far, we have talked about um, how we approach problem solving um, and that we could use algorithms or heuristics or insight. Um, and in this video, what we're going to address is um, when you make decisions, um, problems with using heuristics. Um, and if you use heuristics, um, you may remember they are um, kind of skipping steps. You're making some assumptions about things. Um, and the making these assumptions are going to make um, it um, faster to make a decision. However, I, <coughs> the decisions are much more error prone, um, as some of these examples will um, illustrate. So first of all, problems with using heuristics. Um, when you um, use heuristics, sometimes you have what they call a representativeness heuristic. And this is when you judge things based on how well they match your prototype. So if you remember, we talked about prototypes are kind of this visual representation in your head of a particular category for a particular topic. Um, and we have a representative heuristics is sometimes you have things that don't match up with um, what your prototype is in of your head. So if you remember back to the last um, video where I talked about Jan Janet Evans and I showed you a picture of her and she's very small and um, she's thin and a lot of people look at her and said, oh, she must be, and I told you that she was an Olympic athlete, and a lot of people said, well, either she's a gymnast or an ice skater, but she didn't fit your mental, your prototype of what a swimmer is, so you have this representativeness heuristic. Another example is, is that if you think about doctors, um, this uh, cartoon is talking about it says, I'm afraid we can't accept you as a medical student. Your handwriting is far too legible. Your prototype for your uh, prototype for doctors is that they all have sloppy handwriting, right? So um, this would be a representative heuristic. So if it doesn't fit your prototype, then it automatically must be wrong, right? Another heuristic that's a, a problem with using heuristic is what we call availability heuristic. This is judging things based on how mentally available information is. This happens all the time when you know uh, you are answering a question on a quiz or a test, or the teacher asks a question, and the first thing that pops into your head, that's the thing that's the answer, right? It must be. It was the first thing. It pops so quickly into my head, okay? That's availability heuristic. You are making assumptions and judgments based off from what just pops into your head, what's readily available. Another example, I love this one. Um, this guy is freaking out. I mean, he's sitting there drinking beer, smoking a cigarette, and eating fast food. And what is he scared of uh, be dying from? Ebola. This was uh, in the fall of uh, 2014 where, you know, that Ebola scare. Everybody was talking about Ebola on the news. It was everywhere. Oh, my gosh, you're all going to die from Ebola. It's all over the place. Blah, blah, blah. That's just because it's all, that's what we hear. And so you are mentally, you, it's the most um, available thing. So that's what people have become afraid of. Um, so that's the availability heuristic. And then we can talk about the projective way of knowing heuristic. Um, this is when you assume what other people know, and oftentimes you're assuming that they know the things that you know. For example, I do this all the time. Uh, I talk about things and I give examples in class where I'm making assumptions that you're, you know the things that I know. You have had the same experiences that I have had, which is obviously not true. Um, when I go and introduce my cl uh, classes, uh, myself to classes at the beginning of the class school, um, I always talk about, oh, I'm from Fargo, North Dakota. Anybody seen the movie Fargo? Um, I'm assuming you've heard of the movie Fargo in the first place. Uh, there's a lot of people, it's getting into being an older movie now, there's a lot of people that have never heard of it, right? Um, and that's not, there's nothing wrong with that, but I'm projecting that, you know, because I've heard of it and I know of it, that you should. And that's not always true either. Um, and then the last problem with using heuristics is the anchoring heuristic. Now this is interesting because um, this is when you use the initial information to base your judgments upon. So um, they did this study where um, they had people um, try and estimate the price of things. And so they would have a bunch of just random items, you know, the price of an iPad, the price of a 
um, specific kind of car, the price of a water bottle, the price of a picture frame, um, and they have this huge long list. And so then what they had them do is they get this paper and they'd have them think of the last two digits of their social security number. So they'd think of the last two digits of their social security number and they'd have them write it next to all of these list list of things. Um, and then they would have them go and estimate the price of all of these things. And what they found was is that when the last two digits of their social security number were lower, they were bound to estimate the price of the item as being lower. Or if the, uh, their last two digits were higher, they were bound to estimate higher. So for example, um, this was a picture that I found that actually relates to that, where um, this guy on the left here, uh, he, his social, the last two digits of social security number is 11. So the uh, guy on the right here has the last two digits as 99. Now they're both supposed to estimate the price of this nice French wine. They're both supposed to be given the same information about this French wine. They're supposed to estimate the price. The person that has a lower um, social security number is going to estimate a lower price than the person that has a higher social security number. They're going to estimate a higher price. Um, this is just fascinating to me because the social security thing has absolutely nothing to do with the price of the wine, and yet people use it as an anchor to base their estimate off from. Um, so it's kind of an interesting little heuristic that we will use. Okay, other things with problems with uh, making decisions. Uh, other problems other than heuristics. So sometimes we have this overconfidence. Um, and overconfidence will continue even despite being proven wrong. We will continue with overconfidence. However, overconfidence can be a good thing because generally people are happier and it's easier to make hard decisions if you're overconfident. So if you really believe that you have all the knowledge in the world and you understand how this thing works, it, you know, you're going to have an easier time of making decisions. Um, I do, I am overconfident about um, tasks. Um, like when you have um, a, a list, a schedule of things that you want to accomplish, um, for example, every weekend, you know, on Fridays, I'm you know, getting ready to go home for the weekend and I'm gathering up all the things that I'm going to bring home with me to work on on the weekend. And I'm sitting there thinking, okay, all right, yeah, I'm going to get, you know, all this grading done and I'm going to write this test and I'm going to write the lesson plans for the next week. And I'm also going to do all the things, the family things that I have at home to do. You know, I'm going to help clean the house. I'm going to you know, play games with my kids and I'm going to hang out with my husband and watch television and I have all those things. And what happens is time after time, weekend after weekend, I never accomplish all of them. And yet, I still have that overconfidence every weekend that, yes, this weekend, this is the weekend that I'm going to get all this done. It doesn't happen. Okay? But that's that, over, that idea of overconfidence. Even though I've been proven wrong, I'm still overconfident that I'm going to be able to accomplish it. However, it makes me happier thinking going into the weekend that I'm going to, oh, yes, have all this done. Um, and, you know, it'll make it easier to make decisions about what to uh, take home and, you know, I don't have to make decisions about, you know, what, what to cut out, what I'm not going to be able to do. Okay, another thing, a uh, problem with uh, making decisions is that we also have belief perse perseverance. Um, this is the idea that we stick with a belief even though it's proved to be wrong. Um, the best way to find... <laughs> The best way to try and prove it's not wrong is to consider the opposite side of things. Um, so best example of this, um, I actually thought of this when I was, I was writing these notes when I was um, just finished a book, um, a fictional book, um, that related to this. So uh, have you heard of Anastasia Romanov? Um, Anastasia Romanov was the daughter of the last czar of Russia. Um, and the story goes that um, in the late 20th, or the early 20th century, um, the Romanovs were the last czars, um, and uh, they were overthrown by the communists, Lenin, uh, Lenin included. Um, and they came in, they captured uh, the entire ro uh, royal family, marched them off into the woods, and shot all of them. And then they buried them all in these shallow graves. Um, so the Russian people found out, and they knew that you know the Romanovs were dead, um, but no one could find the body of Anastasia. And for a long time, people believed that Anastasia escaped somehow and she made it to Europe and she survived and she got married and had kids. And there were a lot of people that 
truly believe that they were either Anastasia or that they were Anastasia's descendants. Um, the book that I read was a fictional book, but they had uh, a character in there that um, really believed that he was Anastasia's um, descendant. And the interesting thing is, is that about less than 10 years ago, I don't remember um, what year it was, but they actually unfortunately found another grave um, that was not initially found, and they did find the body of Anastasia. Um, and DNA evidence proved it to be true. However, there are still people in my fictional book, my character that I was reading about, that believed he was the descendant of Anastasia, even though there was DNA evidence that she actually did die um, at the same time as the rest of her family, he still stuck with that false belief. Um, so sometimes that's, that's problematic as well. Um, intuition, our gut feeling, um, can also um, help, have us um, help make decisions. Um, that gut feeling, that quick response, um, it results from our experiences, um, but it can also lead us to overfeel something but and underthink it. So we feel with our gut, but we don't really think with your head. And so sometimes that happens as well. Uh, and the last point that I wanted to make is, is that the way you frame or present something can also um, affect decisions, including political decisions, uh, business decisions, as well as the options that you choose. Um, for example, if you go into the doctors and your doctor tells you that you need surgery, maybe you're having problems with your knee and you need knee surgery. So the doctor tells you, okay, well, uh, you know, they're, um, 80% of the people that have the surgery um, never have any other complications with their surgery. They don't have to have any more surgeries afterwards, and they're just fine. Okay? The way you frame it by saying 80% are just fine, uh, automatically people are like, oh, okay, well, then I'll go right ahead and have this knee surgery. Whereas if the doctor had said, for example, 20% of the people that have this surgery have to come back in later and have to have another surgery or they still continue to have pain and problems and whatever, even though it's just flipping it, people will reconsider the surgery. Um, another example, uh, have you noticed on cereal boxes where um, all of them are now saying like they're whole grain and all this and they're trying to put it all in this great big light and spin? Can you imagine if we had this? Okay, it says Kellogg's genetically modified frosted flakes. Mmm. Hey kids, get ge uh, gene splicer. Yum. I mean, they, they put the packaging on that way to frame it and put it in such a way that that's the one you want to choose. Political um, opponents do this all the time where they'll frame their position in such a way that it makes it sound um, good for them. Okay? And you're bad if you don't choose the same side as them. All right, that's it. That's all I wanted to talk about. Um, let me know if you have any questions.